Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very first Applet Development Workshop. And today's presentation will be by Dr. Sasha Sutherland on anti-doping in sports. So a little about her. Dr. Sasha Sutherland is a current executive director of the Caribbean Regional Anti-Doping Organization. She's also a part-time lecturer at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, where she teaches sports and event management and sports management and marketing. She previously taught philosophy of sports. Just a few housekeeping. Please ensure that your mic is off during this presentation. And if you can, please change your names. Ensure that it is your real name. Also place your spot and country so you can be easily identified. If you have any questions, feel free to place them in the messages and we will get back to you. Over to you, Sasha. Good evening, everybody. How are you? I hope everybody is okay. Um, I'm excited to be here. I know everybody's probably um, tired a bit. It's the middle of the afternoon, work commitments, etc. But I'm hoping that we have a good time today talking about anti-doping. Not a usually upbeat topic, but I'm hoping that we share some more information about why clean sport is important and how the work we do at the Caribbean Rado helps to facilitate sport in the Caribbean and sport internationally. So I am sure most of you have been watching Tokyo 2020, and it just shows us that it's an exciting time for sport. We are almost at the end of the Olympiad. Paralympic Games is about to start, and the action is going to be just as exciting as Tokyo 2020. We have Pan Am Juniors is going to end up our end our year 2021 in terms of major games and then 2022 we're going to have winter olympics in beijing caribbean games in guadeloupe commonwealth games in birmingham and central american and caribbean beach games in colombia at the beginning of the new olympiad and so a lot of um, those games have some people that work in obscurity, like doping control officers and anti-doping organizations to ensure that when athletes compete at these games they do so on a level playing field. Um, they do so for clean sports sake. And at the end of the day, what we do centers the athletes. So today I just wanna share a bit about how our work impacts or affects sport competition regionally and internationally. If you have any questions, feel free to just drop it in the chat. Um, we will address them as they come. So you don't have to wait until the end. So this is just some information about us. You can find the Caribbean Rado on Facebook, on Twitter, and our website is www.caribbeanrado.com. So one of the first things I'd like for you to do is if you're on Twitter, go over and like Rado Caribbean and just say hi, um, so that we know you did at least one thing from this workshop. You follow us and you get some updates on regional and international sports, you know what some of the rules are, you know what's going on in the international community. All right, so I think that's it for me and housekeeping. So let's start this presentation. And I'm gonna do so by welcoming you to the Caribbean. It is a sporting place, one with a sport history par excellence, um, one that privileges values associated with Caribbean parenting and perhaps one of the most successful sporting zones when you analyze the medal won per country uh, throughout Olympic history or medals per capita and total uh, medals per GDP. The Caribbean is an area where sport is treasured, but is also seen as recreational. So there are a lot of paradoxes that happen. It's an area where there are resources put into sport, but not enough in the, the context where athletes can, can succeed at their best. And one where we believe athletes should compete clean, but not one where anti-doping or clean sport is privileged. You know, And so we want to make sure there's additional support for clean sport. Um, and full-time attention paid to the dangers of doping by Caribbean athletes. So in terms of the Caribbean Rado, we're headquartered in Barbados. Um, we represent 18 countries throughout the Caribbean from Turks and Caicos all the way in the north 
down to Suriname and Guyana on the South American continent. We're one of 15 RADOs in the world, one of three in the Americas region, and we are the largest RADO in the world with 18 member countries. Um, we were established back in 2005, and we're here to harmonize efforts towards clean sport in the region. And of course, you know, I couldn't start the presentation without speaking a bit about St. Lucia, right? Um, St. Lucia, small country, yes, but we have some, some very um, famous names coming out of, of this, this tiny island, the Helen of the West Indies. So I'm sure if you look at this um, pictograph, you see a number of people um, that represent St. Lucia in high jump and cricket and swimming and um, traveling and sailing. And of course, one of the more prominent international figures um, at the administrative level, we have a regional vice president of the Commonwealth Games Federation, who is one of St. Lucia's own, Miss Fortuna Belrose. Um, and so St. Lucia is also a sporting place. It is one where we want to privilege athletes, we want to privilege clean sports, and you know the work we do underscores that. So on, on the next slide, I have a, a saying that comes from the World Anti-Doping Code. Every athlete has a right to clean sport. And that is basically like, you know, one of the, the core reasons why we fight doping in sport. In the purpose and the organization of the World Anti-Doping Program, the charter says that we are here to protect the athlete's fundamental right to participate in doping-free sport, promoting health, fairness, equality for all athletes. We also work to provide an opportunity for athletes to pursue human sport and excellence without the use of performance enhancing substances and methods. And we also work to maintain the integrity and spirit of sport in terms of like respect for the rules, respect for other competitors. You know, Shamil speaks about philosophy of sport. I love to tell my students about zero sum logic. When somebody wins and somebody loses, the winner gives the loser the opportunity to come again. So Tokyo 2020 just happened. You have lots of winners, but you also saw a lot of tears for people who didn't medal, who didn't make the podium. They have an opportunity to come to the next Olympia, providing they qualify to try again. So in an effort to maintain fair competition, a level playing field, and the value of clean sport to the world, that is why we operate. And when we talk about the spirit of sport, it is the celebration of the human spirit, the body and mind, which is the essence of Olympism. All of us are parts of the Olympic movement. And these, the essence of Olympism is reflected in Olympic values like respect, excellence, friendship, fair play, teamwork, dedication, and community. Um, okay. So how do we do this? How do we ensure every athlete has a right to clean sports? And how do we ensure that the rules and regulations are the same across the board? Now, everybody knows about WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and everybody kind of assumes that the code is WADA's code. So I want to demystify that. The, word, the code is not WADA's code. WADA is the independent stakeholder that ensures the Olympic committees, the international federations, and other stakeholders adhere to the rules and regulations in the code. And so their mission is to lead a collaborative worldwide movement for doping free sport to ensure that when athletes take the field and they win a medal, that that victory was a clean one. Um, WADA is, well, the Caribbean RADO's mission is actually to lead, promote, and coordinate clean sport in the Caribbean region. And so when you look at this chart, you see the code which is the guiding document for how we ensure clean sport in the region. WADA is the independent stakeholder. But if you look at the organizations represented underneath, to the left, you have the International Olympic and Paralympic Committees and international federations who govern national Olympic and Paralympic Committees and national sport federations. And so that's the, the hierarchy in terms of our rules and regulations handed down. So sometimes we hear athletes saying, but this is just a national level competition. Why do we have to participate in this? Because at the international level, your international federation has said, we are a signatory to the code and we will maintain the rules and values that it takes to maintain the level playing field in sport and to ensure sports are, are clean. And so by virtue of being a member of the international federations, you too must adhere 
to those rules. Now on the right hand side, you see governments and RADOs who are not signatories to the code, but governments through their um, signing of the, um, through the adherence of the UNESCO Convention Against Doping in Sport, they acknowledge that there is a code which they cannot be signatory to as a government agency, but because they are parties to UNESCO, um, they can recognize the code and the implications uh, for, for good governance in sport and anti-doping um, that the code represents. And so even though not a signatory, they're saying we respect the code, we acknowledge it, and we will do what we can from a government to level to ensure that our athletes, our citizens, etc., participating in sport adhere to the code. Now, national anti-doping organizations and regional anti-doping organizations ensure that we have the rules, regulations, programming, etc., to ensure athletes, national sport federations, coaches, doctors, um, attorneys who part who do sport law know those rules are and regulations and work within. Um, the parameters of the rules of the code and its accompanying international standards to guide the athletes and entourage. By virtue of participating in your National Olympic Committee, you have to obey the rules of the code. Um, but there's a differentiation now in 2021 in terms of an elite athlete, international athlete, national level athlete, recreational athlete. And we can answer some of those questions later on in the presentation. So that is how the sporting community operates as it relates to the Royal Anti-Doping Code. That's how all of us become signatories or all of us adhere to the rules and regulations. Now, just under that umbrella, we have the Court of Arbitration for Sports and you have um, independent laboratories. So these are not signatories, but they work in tandem with the other organizations, again, to ensure level playing field. How does that happen? When you are tested, your, your sample has to go to an independent WADA accredited laboratory. So it's not like um, any old lab is going to test your sample and say there was an adverse analytical finding or whatever. It has to go to an accredited laboratory and that laboratory will report the results um, in the ADAMS or the ad, ad, um, Anti-Doping Administrative and Management System. At the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they oversee cases from international federations and other governing bodies. Um, if there is an adverse analytical finding or potential, what is called an anti-doping rule violation, which is basically when someone breaks one of the 11 rules that guide anti-doping, and we'll discuss that um, in, a, in a moment. So the idea behind the coordination of the code and our um, our adherence to the code is that it protects the sport ethic that we spoke about just now, you know, the human effort, the joy found in effort, the ability to win an, on a level playing field. It protects adversaries and themselves. It protects athletes' health uh, more than anything. And again, going back to that statement, it protects the fundamental rights of athletes to participate in doping free sport. Um, so I just wanted to give a background on the, the Caribbean RADO. We already said what our mission was, our vision is to have a unified region committed to clean sport. Um, and our values, our core values are integrity, professionalism, and unity. And so we work with our 18 member countries to ensure we have robust testing and education programs. And I'm happy that supporting girls in sport and the St. Lucia Basketball um, Association have invited us to give this talk so that people are more aware of what we do and the fact that we're not just there checking boxes, but we really want to educate people on the things they need to know when participating in sport as it relates to anti-doping. Um, So this thing called the code, we talk about the code, the code, the code, the code. Again, the code is this guiding document that lays out all the rules of what constitutes an anti-doping rule violation. What um, are the responsibilities of governments? So what are the responsibilities of international federations? What are the responsibilities of athletes and athlete support personnel as it relates to the code? And we are now, as of January 1st, 2021, going through our fourth iteration of the World Anti-Doping Code. We had the first in 2003, then 2009, 2015, and now 2021. Um, and the code is a living document. Huh? It's not just like we hand down these rules and that's it. The idea that um, in 2003, when we had the first iteration, the idea was to ensure that there were 
international guidelines for how we manage um, doping control because everybody had their own rules. And so, you know, under one jurisdiction, there might be one set of rules, but if you go and compete somewhere else, the rules might be different. And it was kind of hard to track everything. And so as we moved with every, every change, every new code, the rules became more harmonized. It addressed issues or major scandals in sport that said, hey, we, we didn't account for this before, perhaps because it didn't happen, but now we need to facilitate that. So that's the code, as I said, is a living document and it, um, it aims to capture what is happening in contemporary sporting society. So this 2021 code, some of the things we're going to talk about is um, countries having code compliant anti-doping programs. And so with this code, there's pressure for outstanding performance. Um, it recognizes that there's pressure for outstanding performances by athletes from the society, from media, from sponsors, from coaches, teams, and even family members, you know, winning at all costs and bragging rights are just some of the reasons why athletes use performance enhancing substances. The pressure becomes too much and some athletes break and they take, they take performance enhancing substances. And so what the 2021 code asks is that we place more responsibilities on all stakeholders from that initial um, umbrella document we looked at to implement anti-doping programs. So governments, Olympic committees, national sport federations, um, major event organizers, because they recognize that there are few countries with well-developed and complete anti-doping programs. And the majority of countries might have competing social and economic priorities. So if we have all the information in one location, it's easy to encourage um, sports and federations to have robust anti-doping programs. And because we want it to be sustainable, we understand that it's a process that takes time. So for those of you who are hearing about anti-doping for the first time, education is one of the first steps, one of the first encounters we want athletes to have when it comes to, to doping in sports or anti-doping in sport. Now, that's the code. The code then has eight documents that supports it, eight international standards. The international standard for education, that's a new one, it came in force in 2021. The prohibited list that we always hear about, the, the substances banned in and out of competition or in particular sports, and that's renewed every year on January 1st. We have a new prohibited list that comes out, but it doesn't just come out on January 1st. In October of the preceding year, the list of banned substances goes out to the international sporting community so that athletes have an opportunity to peruse that list through their teams um, and wean off any substance that might be on that list so that by the time it comes on January 1st, 2021, um, there is not an issue. There's also the international standard for testing and investigations. Um, this is how we do the anti-doping testing program. So this will give you guidelines to how you approach an athlete, how you notify them about testing. It will give you um, information on how you select athletes for testing, risk assessments and test distribution plans, a whole lot of technical documents. But what it does, it ensures that when a sample is collected, the integrity of the sample collection process is maintained so that if that sample returns what is called an adverse analytical finding, which is basically a banned substance in your urine or your blood sample, or an indication that a performance enhanced method was used. Someone can't say, well, no, they carried me in this dark room that I didn't agree to. And they just, you know, forcibly took my blood against my will. There's a way in which we, we do all these things to ensure the integrity of the process. Then the international standard for laboratories tells the labs the manner in which they should test. It's a rigorous process to become a water accredited laboratory. For those athletes who might have to take a substance on the prohibited list, um, not to gain an advantage, but for health reasons, there's an international standard for therapeutic use exemption. So basically, you know, the layman's terms, is basically a hall pass to use a prohibited substance because for medical reasons, an athlete might need to use this particular drug and there isn't an alternative for the condition um, what, for which the, uh, the athlete would need that, that medication. Another new standard that has come into being is the International Standard for the Protection of Privacy and Personal Information. And basically, this assures athletes that when your information is taken on a doping control form, 
or your information is obtained by an anti-doping organization. It's not going to be sold to a third party for marketing. It's not going to be used for other than the intent of anti-doping. Um, and the information will not be kept um, indefinitely, right? It's going to be used for the intended purpose. Another new um, international standard that we have is the international standard for code compliance by signatories. Um, this standard ensures that governments, national anti-doping organizations, et cetera, do what they're supposed to do um, in terms of testing and well, anti-doping programs in country and in, in federations. And then there's the international standard for results management, which provides guidelines uh, for where there's an adverse analytical finding or the potential for an anti-doping rule violation, the process of notifying the athlete that there's a charge brought against them, doing an administrative review, if it's a whereabouts um, case, uh, how the court is organized in terms of the athlete having the right to a fair hearing, how you issue the second notice saying, well, this is the charge that has been brought against you, this is the reason decision, and therefore, if we find you guilty, this is the period of ineligibility, so you won't be able to participate in sport, etc. So the code is one document. It has these eight supporting international standards. And then you also have these best practice models and guidelines that we use um, and that we distribute to, to organizations, anti-doping organizations, who may not have the human resource or financial capacity to establish those practices and those guidelines on their own. So they're basically templates that organizations can use and adapt to their law in country and adapt to how sport is practice in those particular countries. So I am going to play a very short clip because it's supposed to be interactive. And a lot of people think anti-doping is just boring, um, but it really isn't. Um, you can, you can have fun with it if you know what's going on. I just realized because I'm sharing a PDF, we may not be able to hear it. So if you give me one minute, I'm going to stop my share and find it on YouTube so that we can look at it. Are there any questions? Um, does anyone have any questions, queries, concerns? while I try to find um, the Zoom document, somebody asked to zoom in to the presentation a bit more. So I hope you'll be able to see it when I, when I zoom back out. This is Sophia and Michael. The two became aware of- Excellent audio. After hearing about a- Pardon? No, I was saying good audio. Good audio as well. Okay, fantastic. Positive doping test in the news. But you know, doping really begins in our society, says Michael. For example, it becomes routine for people to take painkillers or other drugs when recovering from an illness or to withstand pressure in the workplace. This can create a false or deceptive image that downplays the risks of taking medication. Even advertising contributes to this deceptive image. In competitive sport, Sophia continues, the main reasons for doping are the high expectations of success by the media, the audience, sponsors, and trainers, but political pressure and the commercial structure of competitive sport contribute too. Sophia also mentions that in the past, professional athletes often put all their eggs in one basket. They neglected to prepare for an alternative career the high pressure this created made many athletes turn to doping as a last resort. Michael is surprised and for the first time. a doping violation as well. Even manipulation or attempted manipulation of the doping test is seen as doping, Sophia continues. Michael is impressed. Now he understands the strict policy. Sophia continues, well, doping is cheating and harms the entire sport, not just the athlete. 
together against doping, doping prevent. Okay. So that is our first um, video regarding doping and just trying to make it a bit interactive. So basically the code article two has 11 indicators of what doping might be. So article 2.1, the presence of a substance or method, article 2.2, the use, article three, um, 2.3, evading. And this does happen. You know, when you see the doping control officer for those athletes who think, oh my gosh, I might have something in my substance, in my, in my urine, they take off running in another direction. And so we're asking you, if you know you're playing clean and playing fair, don't, don't do it. Let when the doping control officers come, please go to the station. We're not going to take you to area 51 or any other obscure area. We're not going to do any ridiculous testing on you. It is basically the passage of, of urine or taking a blood spot um, to ensure that you're maintaining a level playing field. Um, in addition to evasion, it might be another big one, especially for athletes in our region. We try to educate on whereabouts. So basically, if in St. Lucia, we have 100 athletes and the top 20 are really elite, um, high professional, high profile athletes. We might constitute or we might um, coordinate what is called a registered testing pool. We might say to those athletes, because you all are the best in St. Lucia, we want to make sure we know where you are at every um, point in time. We want to be able to test you. We want to make sure you're not cheating. And you have to submit your information to say, I train Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at the stadium between four and six. Um, I have to go to a competition in December. And so the, you can change your calendar, basically. It's like setting a calendar for antidoping to say, this is where I am. This is what the next three months of my life is going to look like. And you can come find me in these locations. So athletes who are part of a registered testing pool, more often than not, they're elite athletes. You have to provide that information. In addition to providing where you train, the hours, the location where you work, your home, contact information, um, you also have to provide a one hour window where you say, this is where I'm going to be at all times. So that if you turn up at this, uh, this, this particular hour that I've indicated, you will definitely be able to find me at all times, God willing. So most athletes would put where they're likely to, to be overnight, where they sleep, for example. So you can get them early in the morning or late in the evening. Then some athletes try to tamper with the equipment and with parts of the process. Some people try to, um, they, they have drugs on them, that's possession. Some people try to sell it, that's trafficking. You administer to others. And that is especially for like coaches and, you know, medical practitioners who are part of the entourage or the athlete support personnel who might be responsible for administering drugs to an athlete or um, prohibited substances, I should say, more so than drugs. Then if you know someone who's engaging in anti-doping rule violation behavior and you're associating yourself with that person, you're part of the scheme, that's where complicity and association comes in. Under the 2021 code, a new article, Article 2.11, which is discouraging or retaliating against the reporting of anti-doping, is a, a new anti-doping rule violation. You cannot prevent someone from reporting a case of doping in sport. Right. So basically, doping is not just the presence of, of a prohibited substance in your urine. It constitutes a number of other challenges. So we went through what is doping. I have another video for you. Now that we know what doping is, this one is on the doping control process. So again, for athletes, you know, a lot of times an athlete's first engagement with anti-doping is because they've been chosen for a test. And really and truly, that's not what we want a 15 year old or 17 year old or even 11 year, an 11 year old who might be representing St. Lucia um, to have as their first engagement with anti-doping. So hence uh, a webinar like this one. We want athletes to have the knowledge first so that you could make reasoned decisions about what you're gonna do in sport. And then by the time you are at the age or the, the level, the participation level where there has to be testing involved, you kind of know the process. So the next one, the next video 
and again, I'm going to have to look for it online, is basically the, whoopsie, the doping control process. So just let's escape that one, the doping control process. And I really apologize. I have a baby who is trying to be a part of the, the session as well. So if you see me looking away, it's because nap time was cut short for some reason. Doping control is an essential okay. part of anti-doping programs to promote and protect the integrity of sport and the health of athletes. Testing is carried out in accordance with the World Anti-Doping Code and a series of international standards. Hi, I am a doping control officer, also known as a DCO. I play a major role in protecting your rights in the doping control process, which consists of five phases. Athlete selection. Athlete notification. Sample collection. Sample analysis. And results management. How can you be selected for testing? Testing can be conducted in two situations, in competition and out of competition. For in competition testing, the selection may occur in a number of ways, including by random selection, based on finishing position, or by being targeted for a particular reason. For out of competition testing, you may be tested anytime, anywhere, with no advance notice. If you have been identified in a registered testing pool, you will be required to provide whereabouts information. You may be tested at home, at your training location, or other relevant locations. How will you be notified? The notification process is the same for both in and out of competition testing. If you are selected for testing, I will show you my DCO accreditation to demonstrate that I'm authorized to conduct testing. I will also explain your rights and responsibilities in the doping control process and ask you to sign a form. Once you have been notified, you must report immediately to the doping control station. You may request a delay for a valid reason, such as you are taking part in a medal ceremony. You must attend a press conference. You require medical treatment. Upon notification, a DCO or chaperone will stay at your side at all times until the testing process has been completed. What is the sample collection process? During this process, you also have specific rights, such as having a representative with you, as well as certain responsibilities. I will first ask you for a valid photo ID to confirm your identity. You will be asked to provide one or more urine samples and or blood samples. When you are ready to provide a urine sample, a doping control official of the same gender as you will witness the passing of the sample and will stay with you until you provide a sample that meets all requirements. You will then be asked to divide the urine sample into B and A bottles and then seal them. Throughout the process, you will be the only one to handle the sample collection equipment unless you require assistance. Finally, you will be asked to review and sign the doping control form. The samples and a copy of the form that does not disclose your identity will be sent to a WADA accredited laboratory, while the other copies will go to the relevant anti-doping organizations. A copy of the form will also be provided to you. How are the samples analyzed? I'm sorry, are you all still able to see the video? I just got a message that you can't see it. No. I can't see, but I've been listening. Oh, no. <laughs> no way. I was seeing, but then I just started listening. <laughs> no, that's definitely not how we want to. Um... <laughs> no. <laughs> That's horrible. Okay, so 3.38 is where we are. Let us, let us correct that. Oh my, I didn't realize. Not cool at all. Google Chrome. Lies. Can you Once see it now? Once your arrives at the laboratory, it will be open yeah. and analyzed. The 
sample will be securely stored. Should the A sample reveal an adverse analytical finding, the B sample will be analyzed to confirm the result. How are the results managed? The lab will report the results to the anti-doping organization responsible for results management. A copy will be sent to WADA to ensure the accountability of the process. In the event of an adverse analytical finding, your rights include requesting and attending the B sample analysis within set deadlines, a fair hearing, and the right to an appeal. As an essential deterrent, a standard doping control process across all countries helps protect the right of athletes to compete on a level playing field in the true spirit of sport. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to share um, all of these. I'm going to share all of the um, links in the chat. Oopsie especially because you couldn't see that one just now. So we have a, the first question. How strictly do they consider your whereabouts? Is there a number of chances they'll give for you not to be at your whereabouts? That is a fantastic question. I am going to answer it in a few slides down when we talk about whereabouts information. But if by the time we get to whereabouts, I didn't remember to address it, just remind me, um, Marie. All right. So let's go back to the presentation. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So the next big ticket item is usually therapeutic use exemptions. Remember, we mentioned this before. If you are an athlete participating in sport and you have to take a substance that is on that prohibited list, then you need what is called a therapeutic use exemption. You need a hall pass that says, I am not taking this substance to enhance my performance. I am taking this substance for medical reasons. So I'm going to digress and say everybody remembered, remembers what happened just before Tokyo and a particular athlete from one of the teams um, using the, the good herb um, or that, that leafy substance called marijuana. And there was a big debacle about it. And so we had to clarify the rules for number of persons in the region, but we can talk about that in Q&A. The whole idea is that if you have to take any particular substance, there's a medical approach behind athletes being allowed. And it's not so much a disciplinary one. It's not about beating athletes over the head and saying, no, you can't. But it's a process that gives both physicians and athletes a greater sense of responsibility. The code tells athletes that you are responsible for every substance you put into your body, and as a physician, you need to ensure you don't prescribe something for an athlete that can potentially provide an anti-doping rule violation. And so what the TUE or the therapeutic use exemption recognizes is the, acknowledges the legitimate right to medical treatment for athletes. At the end of the day, what we do is, is centered around athletes. And so we reject the idea of medical treatment being used as an excuse for doping, right? So in this, uh, another pictogram, your basketball team, one of the athletes might have a particular medical condition and they go to the doctor. The doctor then prescribes this medication. Now, before the doctor actually prescribes the medication, what we advise is that you check the prohibited list to see if that, that substance, and it's not the medication, so you won't go and put in like, Panadol or Ventolin, you put in the active ingredient like salbuterol. And so the active ingredient is what you look for on the prohibited list. If that substance is prohibited in competition and you're going to a competition, you know you shouldn't use it. If the medication is not is prohibited out of competition, you shouldn't use it at all. Or if it's prohibited, excuse me, in particular sports, then you know for sure you shouldn't use it. Now, the caveat is an athlete who needs to use that medication and there's no alternative, then, you know, we can't tell the athlete you can't participate in sports. We're going to say to you, apply for therapeutic use exemption. So if the, uh, the medication is not prohibited, you see the X, it's not prohibited, you can go ahead and take it, it's fine. If it is a prohibited substance, you apply for therapeutic, 
use exemption on this form, you fill out your demographic information, you fill out the medical condition that's wrong with the athlete, you fill out um, basically some, some historical information. So when did the athlete first start getting these symptoms? How long has this doctor been treating them, etc.? That form signed and stamped by your medical practitioner is then sent to the anti-doping organization. An independent therapeutic use exemption committee is going to be established and they're going to review that application. Now, if they review the application and the information, the medical information submitted is okay, then they may approve the use of that substance by the athlete. However, if they find that there might be an alternative treatment or an alternative medication that can be used by the athlete, they may potentially deny the TUE process. Under the 2021 code, one of the things that's happening is that, you know, TUEs and sanctions under the code in one jurisdiction are allowed to be recognized in other jurisdictions. So it's not like, um, you know, St. Lucia Basketball or the St. Lucia Anti-Doping Organization says no, and then you try to go to another anti-doping organization to get it. They're recognized across the board. So what do we tell athletes? Use the safe sites for checking the medication you want to take. One, don't take anything from your friends that doesn't come, you know, that comes in a bottle that's not labeled, you don't know what it is, et cetera. Somebody tells you, take this pill, you're going to run faster and you haven't done your research. Don't just share supplements um, because we found that with supplements, they don't always put the ingredients, all the ingredients on the labels. And so we've had cases in the region before where athletes took a supplement and they, their samples returned uh, an adverse finding. And then it was able to be traced to the supplement that they were taking. And so rather than put yourself in that precarious situation, we just tell athletes, you know, the food that you eat should be enough to cover. But if you do want to take a supplement, then the third image, supplement 411, download the app, check it out, check your batch numbers. It can tell you that this batch has been tested and there is no prohibited substance contained within. Informed Sports is another trusted source. They, they check supplements um, to see whether or not they can prohibited substances and then the all the way to the right you see the logo for global dro this has to do with medications so any medication you want to take you're able to go online global dro you put in the location that you probably purchased the medication so it's either the us the uk canada or, or one of those um large entities that produce medication, you put in whether you're an athlete or coach, et cetera, the sport, you accept the terms and agreement, which is basically to say, you know, the site doesn't give medical information. It's just telling you, you know, whether or not this substance is prohibited in and out of competition, in competition or in particular sports. And it would actually tell you where or when that substance is prohibited. Um, so again, we encourage athletes to use the information that's out there. At the end of the day, it's really not that hard because we have experts, scientific experts, medical experts who are already doing the information. So it's not as difficult for you to obtain the information. And everybody has a phone. So everything now, you can have an app that helps you through the process. So Marie asked the question about the, the strictness of um, whereabouts information and having chances. So the whole idea behind whereabouts is that, um, well, let me start by saying, if, you don't, if you're in a registered testing pool and you do not submit or update your information, it's called a filing failure. And that's like a strike one. If you can't be found at a location that you indicated during your 60 minute window time slot, that's called a missed test. So for athletes who are in a registered testing pool, any combination of three filing failures and or missed tests in a 12 month period constitute an anti-doping rule violation. Right? And so um, what the anti-doping organization will do is they will send you a notice of charge and they will tell you that this is what they found X number of times you've been absent or you didn't update your whereabouts information. They've tried contacting you to tell you update the information. They try to find you to do a test and because you've had three in the last 12 months, they're filing an anti-doping violation against you. You then have the opportunity to reply 
not to justify, but to say something unusual might have happened. They will then do what is called an administrative review. If at the end of that review, they realize your story is bogus or something is not adding up, they may move forward with the anti-open rule violation, right? Now, because we are interested in intentional cheats, and as I said, the code really centers the athletes and we wanna be fair to athletes. So everything we do, we think, what if this was unintentional, you know? What we want to get is the people who are really trying to evade testing, really trying to evade sample collection, the, the real cheats, right? So once it is realized or recognized that there's an intentional violation so that you just didn't turn up or you just, you're duck in, the, the open control officers, um, the, the sanction is a four-year sanction, right? It used to be two years. So I hope that answers your question, Marie, that you do get chances and you get the opportunity to explain yourself. But if the, the, if you just ignore the emails or, you know, you just didn't upload the information because you didn't feel like it, that's not enough to vindicate you. Now, in terms of submitting the, the, the information, a lot of athletes ask, well, where do we submit it? It is done through ADAMS, the Anti-Doping Administrative and Management System, and it's an online web-based tool. So again, you can, you can change the information in your phone. It's like a calendar, um, so it's not difficult to maneuver. And so the 60-minute period for those athletes who are in a registered testing pool is between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m. So just state in one hour where you will be available for testing at any point in time. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that is what I want to say about um, whereabouts. So let us go to the next slide. Again, if you have any questions, drop it in the chat and I'll, I'll take a peek. Now, when it comes to results management, so let's say after I've gone through the code, how it works, how the anti-doping organizations work, um, how to use work, et cetera. Let's say an athlete was deliberate. They took a, a prohibited substance. It's sent to the lab. Um, it's accompanied with a lab analysis request form, right? So the lab will test that sample. <laughs> they will then report the findings of that sample to WADA, to the National Anti-Doping Organization of the country. So St. Lucia NADO or St. Lucia NOC. Note that for countries who do not have a national anti-doping organization, the National Olympic Committee becomes the de facto NADO. So let's say Roxanne, for example, test, she, she got tested. The lab will send the results to WADA. It would send the results also to the anti-doping organization, and I would send it to her international federation, right? If when the organizations, these are the ones responsible for results management of the athlete, they check, they realize, oh, she has a therapeutic use exemption for this. So once you get the approved therapeutic use exemption, the committee uploads that information into Adams. That's like the clearinghouse for everything anti-doping. So if she has the therapeutic use exemption, the process stops there, she's able to go ahead and compete. Somebody's asking a question. If, however, there's no therapeutic use exemption, then the results management entity will assert an anti-doping rule violation for Roxanne. So that was the first the, the A sample that was tested. When you do the test, you pour the samples into the A and B bottle as we learned from the doping control process. The athlete has a right to be there at the B sample testing. Um, Okay, so we'll get to high testosterone <laughs> in Q&A. So we do a B sample testing. If in the B sample, there is no evidence of the prohibited substance found in the A sample, then they're not corroborated. Um, there's, there's no anti-doping rule violation brought against because the A and B samples corroborate whether there's an anti-doping rule violation or not. So then you stop the process the athlete is free to compete. If, however, the B sample corroborates what is found in the A sample, then sorry, Roxanne, here in time. The assertion of the anti-doping rule violation continues. The, the anti-doping organization who's responsible for results management will have an independent 
results management committee that will hear the case. Um, you know, it depends on whether it's a first time fault, the degree of fault, like if the athlete knew or if a coach gave the, the, the drug to, to him or to her, if the athlete is a minor, if it's a recreational athlete. So there are a number of variables at play, which is why hearings go on a case by case basis. So um, if there's no sanction for whatever mitigating circumstances, the athlete might still have a warning, but they're, they're free to go. If there is a sanction and the athlete does not agree, they then go to an appeal panel. So it doesn't stop again. We're just here about the integrity of the process and about ensuring the athlete has a right to compete in clean sport. Another panel, not the same one, will hear the appeal and they will either uphold the decision, partially uphold the decision, or reject the reason decision done by the first panel. So this is, again, just a crash course in how the system works. We don't expect you to know all this information at the end of it, but you should at least know that what an antidoping rule violation is and that it's more than just the presence of a substance or a method. You should know by the end of this that if you want to take something that's on the prohibited list, you should apply for a TUE. You should also know that if you want to apply for a TUE, uh, another caveat is that you should apply for it at least 30 days in advance of your competition. So don't wait two days before and say, oh, shucks, I go into this competition and I need to have an antidoping rule. Um, I need to have a therapeutic use exemption. I'm just making a note um, that I see here to address something in the Q&A as well, right? You want to make sure you have all your ducks lined up, so to speak, as the Caribbean people would say, and you want to make sure that you are at least generally aware of how the antidoping world works. Okay, so athlete rights and responsibilities. We just basically spoke about athlete responsibilities, right? You have a responsibility to submit your whereabouts information. You have a responsibility to apply for TUE if you need to use a prohibited substance. You have a responsibility to ensure you know what's going into your system because the code speaks about strict liability. You are responsible for everything that goes into your system. You have a responsibility to ensure that your athlete support personnel, those who are around you, know about the code, the international standards, and the accompanying guidelines. You have a responsibility to know where your anti-doping organization is. So should you need a therapeutic use exemption, you can apply for it. All of these responsibilities you have. But what about your rights as an athlete? After all, we did say an athlete has a right to participate in doping free sport. So in 2021, the Athletes Anti-Doping Rights Act has been championed for athletes. And so I wanna to talk to the athletes now, but again, athlete support personnel, this is where we support them and we ensure they do what is right. Now, um, when you talk about vulnerability moments for athletes. We kind of spoke about it before, that there's pressure by parents, by coaches, countries coming out of the Olympic Games just now. I don't know how many of you were following the case um, of the Belarusian athlete who questioned the coaches and was ordered back home. It's, it's an ongoing case that we're paying attention to, not as an anti-doping organization, but just as people in the sport community and we talk about Olympism and the joy found in participation and the Olympic movement and, you know, higher, faster, stronger. Now they've added on together and the motto, athletes are vulnerable because they're expected to bring home medals. They're expected to do well. They're expected not to challenge society. And so we realize or we recognize there have been some fundamental challenges with athletes who wish to participate in sport. And so with the Athletes Anti-Doping Rights Act, what we do is we recognize those vulnerabilities, but we also want to reinforce values. We want to recognize that athletes want to improve on their, um, on their results. We want to specialize education for athletes. We want to start young so that, again, an athlete's first encounter with doping is not being tested at an international meet. And it is really a humbling experience when you have to drop your pants in front of a doping control officer and pass urine. There is nothing quote unquote humane about it. But the idea is that this is what it takes to ensure the process is clean and there's a level playing field and that everyone owns their responsibility and their rights to participate. So we spoke a lot about parents, we spoke a lot about coaches, but this next, um, this next image 
tells us, you know, when we talk about athlete support personnel and the athlete entourage, this is who we are speaking about, the International Federation, the National Federation, the NOC, the clubs, parents, schools, family, high level training centers, unions for those athletes who are participating in leagues, the media, and you know that our media could be very critical sometimes, sponsors, organizers, lawyers, healthcare providers, um, equipment service providers who might be sponsoring a particular athlete, agents, the spectators, we wanna come and see a good show. And of course, governments and employers, right? When I give you time off from work, you better go bring home a medal, right? Don't just go there to participate. And so your vulnerability moments as athletes can come with changing clubs or training environment, entering into a higher level of competition. If you experience the loss, if you feel the pressure to win, or if you've had an injury and you want to come back from that injury, those are what we recognize as vulnerability moment, moments. And that's what has been shared by the International Testing Agency when they speak to athletes about you know, doping control. Um, So before we even move forward, we, I hope you have pen and paper, or if you have your phone, you can just type it in. We talk about values and traits, right? What are the markers of your personality? When you connect with your personal values, you can chart a course that's right for you. And basically they're saying is if you're grounded, as most Caribbean people are, I'm going to just put it out there. I would like to think that most of us are grounded then we know where we come from. We know we don't want to make mommy and daddy sad or we know we want to make them proud, but at the same time, we want to do so within the, the rules and regulations of sport. So Roy Disney says that when your values are clear to you, making decisions, and I would add there about doping in sport becomes easier. So I want you to look at the next screen. Um, it goes from loyalty, humor, security, wisdom. And if you can just choose three values, or perhaps choose 10 and then type in the chat your top three values when you think of your participation in sport as an athlete, as an administrator, as a parent, as a spectator, as a supporter, as a medical practitioner. So I'll give you three minutes because I want to call out some of them, please. Um, look at them, choose the ones you like. But then if you had to choose three values that you think would guide your sport participation, what would they be? Anybody? Y'all still hearing me? Y'all still there? Okay, I see honesty, helpfulness, and dedication. What else? Top three. Loyalty, dedication, and health. All right, one more. One more and then we move on. But for the others, you can still type it in. Cooperation, honesty, accountability. Nice. Cooperation, respect success. Fantastic. So the whole idea behind the Athlete Anti-Doping Rights Act is that athletes are human. We've heard a lot about that at the Olympic Games, again, with some of the, the challenges that um, some of the athletes were having with respect to the rules. Um, and so it's just, it just provides a starting point for the discussion on athletes' rights and responsibilities as it pertains to um, doping in sports, right? And so the International Testing Agency recognizes that the majority of athletes do not do, 
but many can be vulnerable at critical moments, as we said, when you change in a club after injury, et cetera. Making decisions based on personal values will help you during critical moments to decide whether or not your honesty, your dedication, your respect, um, your success. Um, what I also said, cooperation, your accountability, your loyalty, your health, you know, your dedication is enough during that vulnerability moment to lose all of that for one simple victory. And now that you know more about yourself, we advocate for athletes to use those values in all their decisions, big and small, apply them to your career in sports as an athlete, as athlete support personnel, and as administrators. So to the athlete's rights, according to the Athlete's Anti-Doping Rights Act, um, you have the right to equality of opportunity, right? So when, in respect of sport participation, you have the right to equitable and fair testing programs. You have the right to medical treatment and the protection of your health rights as an athlete. So there is no way any doping control official is going to see an athlete bleeding or in need of medical treatment and say, no, 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 you have to come and get tested first. That doping control officer or chaperone will accompany you to that area where you need medical attention, especially if it's not like a serious injury where you need surgery and ensure you get the medical treatment. And then antidoping becomes secondary only to that or to the medal, medal presentation or to do in a camera interview, but you're still obligated to go. You have a right to justice when it comes to results management and the participation in sport, but you also have a right to accountability, whistleblower rights. You have the right to say that something is going on and not to be treated unfairly because of that. You have a right to education. So again, I'm going to just give kudos to the St. Lucia Basketball um, Association to supporting girls in sport and to FIBA Americas for the Adelante program to ensure that you guys have these athlete workshops to help bolster your participation in sports, starting with anti-doping, because we don't talk about anti-doping a lot, but what we do underscores your participation in sport. We ensure that there's a level playing field so that at the time where that first whistle blows, you know that you're competing against a team that is clean, or if somebody's cheating, bet your bottom dollar. Once we have a robust testing and education program, we're going to find out and there's going to be justice for the athlete. You also have a right to data protection. So nobody should be blasting your information. Well, you know, Ricardo got tested the other day and they said X, Y, and Z about him even before the process is finished. You have a right to compensation. You have a right to protected persons' rights, whether those are minors or persons who may participate in sport, but they, they are deemed um, without the necessary uh, capabilities to make sound judgments on their own. So minors, persons with disabilities, et cetera. You have sample collection rights and our forms, um, it's just out of my reach, they actually speak to some of those, those rights. Now when I'm just gonna grab it and show you. So this is the doping control form that an officer will um, approach you with. And at the back of that form, when the athlete, when the doping control officer notifies you are your rights and responsibilities as an athlete. So it would say things like, this always start with the rights. You have the right to a representative or an interpreter, especially if I speak English and the person is Spanish or French, for example. You have a right to ask for additional information about the sample collection process. You have a right to request a delay in reporting for reasons um, acceptable, the medical attention, medal ceremony, um, medical attention, <laughs> medal ceremony, or to do a television interview. And then if you're an athlete with an impairment, you have a right to request modifications to the sample collection procedure. You also have responsibilities to remain within direct observation of the doping control officer of the chaperone at all times from the point initial contact is made by the chaperone until the end of the sample collection procedure. And the end of that procedure is deemed when you've passed the sample, you've sealed the bottles and you've signed the end of this form saying, I agree with what was done in the sample collection process and saying that you don't feel like your rights or anything was infringed. Um, you have a right to produce appropriate identification so that we can identify that we have the right person. There's no way I want to say we want Roxanne, but then by accident, we pick up Shernil and not, and not Roxanne. 
you have a responsibility to comply with sample collection procedures because failure to do so, as we learned earlier, might constitute an anti-doping violation. And then in competition, you have a right to report immediately for sample collection unless there are valid reasons for delay. And so it explains things like wanting to use samples in research, et cetera. So we don't just come with any willy-nilly papers. These forms are, are pre-manufactured uh, uh, for the doping control process and there are notes on every, on every form to ensure athletes are aware of what their rights and responsibilities are. The information that goes to the lab, a lot of athletes always ask, well, how do we know, you know the lab doesn't have our information? Even though you complete this entire form, right? The anti-doping organization keeps this initial copy. The athlete gets a copy of everything that was written on the front page, but then the lab gets redacted copies. And so that redacted copy will only have the sport, whether it was in or out of competition, the sample collection date, the gender of the athlete, the testing order code, the discipline of the athlete, so sport discipline. So it's not enough to say basketball. You have to, like, whether it's 5v5, 3v3, or if it's athletics, you'd say javelin, high jump, 110 hurdles. If it's aquatics, you'd say 50-meter butterfly. Um, so it's very specific because with each discipline, there are different levels and tests that must be done by the laboratory. Um, it might also ask for the equipment that you're using in the sport and then your sample, the time that was sealed, the amount of urine that you passed, the sample code number and the specific gravity, uh, which is, you know, the, 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 the concentration of the urine at, at an acceptable level that it can be tested. And then the confirmation of the procedure dated and time. So the lab does not receive any markers that would suggest, oh, this is Roxanne from St. Lucia who plays netball, for example, right? So you have a right, that's just part of your sample collection, right? You have a right to have your B sample analyzed if there's an adverse analytical finding in the first sample. And then you have a right to ensure that your other rights and freedoms are not affected. So nobody can, you know, demean you and make you feel less than because you've been chosen for sample collection. Quite the contrary, our colleagues in the US, for example, um, they often put give the athlete stickers saying, you know, 90 mLs strong. Like you know, when you run a marathon, you get those stickers to put on your vehicle or, you know, I made my, my contribution today, my 90 mLs, et cetera. And so they celebrate clean sport as opposed to hopping on anti-doping. And so any other application and standing that are deemed acceptable at the point in time, you have a responsibility or a right to. And then in addition to those rights that are written into the act, there are some recommended ones. You have, you have the right to an anti-doping system that's free of corruption. So recently there has been a lot of talk about having anti-doping organizations that are operationally independent from national Olympic associations or committees from international federations or from um, governments, for example, because you know, the, the term we use in, in the Caribbean or being pays by the tune, you don't want that. You want athletes to know that this process is legitimate. It is free of corruption, etc. And so when they engage in sample collection, they want to know that nothing is being corrupted or manipulated that could affect the outcome on the field of play or in training um, or even in their sample. You have a right as an athlete to participate in governance and decision making. So at the IOC level, you realize there's an athlete commission for anti-doping. You know, we collaborate with athletes. And so there's always this recommendation to ensure you have an athlete rep when there are major decisions being done. And so it doesn't mean you have like an athlete for every step of the way, but you might lean towards working with the athlete commission to ensure your outreach, pro outreach programs are acceptable and it can reach athletes um, in a fun and engaging way. And then you have the right to legal aid. So a lot of athletes sometimes might have their sample return the adverse analytical finding. It has a prohibited substance or banned substance in it. But then there's no representation for that athlete. As anti-doping organizations, while we have to bring a case against you, it is also our responsibility to say if you do not have 
um, legal representation. You can look at X place, so this body might be able to help you um, with that for hearings and the appeal processes. So we don't just bring the accusation. We, again, we censor the athlete and we say, because you have a right to participate in clean sport, we're going to do everything we can to make sure if you're intentionally cheated, that you're duly processed. But if it was, un if it was unintentional, there will be some level of, of processing or sanctioning, but you know, there's a lot of education and rehab rehabilitation that can take place. And if it was really like something where you just did not know, which at this juncture, no athlete should be able to say they didn't know, we provide you the support you need um, to make your case at the anti-doping organization level. So basically, that is what I really wanted to share with you with regards to with regard to athletes and anti-doping and what we do and how what we do in obscurity helps you to succeed publicly. I have maybe a few more minutes. So I did add a few more slides on the 2021 code. We just went through the anti-doping athletes rights act. And I wanted you to know about some of the major changes, the most significant changes to the World Anti-Doping Code in 2021 that you should know as an athlete or that your athlete support personnel should know about. And so when it comes to anti-doping rule violations, we change some of the definitions. And of course, this is not WADA alone doing this, but it was done in consultation with over 650 international federations, Olymp national Olympic committees, major event organizers, and other stakeholders in the sporting community. So in Article 2.5, the whole definition of tampering has been expanded to specifically include fraudulent conduct during results management. So if you're, you're intentionally trying to tip over the bottle or you leave on a ring um, or you put back a red ring when the, the doping control officer wasn't looking and the officer's like, no, but this, this was on. How did this sample leak? Things like that. We've, we've expanded the definition. Uh, because some athletes, not all, can be cheeky. Then the whole idea of prohibited association in previous iterations of the code, the, the anti-doping organization would have had to send a letter or notification to the sporting community that a particular individual was serving a period of ineligibility or ban, to put it in simple terms. Now, prior notification is no longer necessary, but the athlete must have known of the disqualifying status of this particular person. So that's Article 2.10. And then whistleblower protection is a new article that was added for persons who want to speak up is the campaign that WADA calls it, um, which is whistleblower protection, where you can anonymously report doping in sport. And so there's whistleblower protection. And this was because of the Russian scandal where some uh, participants in the state-sponsored doping program wanted to, um, or did and wanted to share information about what was going on, but they feared for their life and they had to flee uh, the country. So there's now a whole, the whole concept of whistleblower protection under the 2021 code. Now, when we talk about the prohibited list and technical documents that are accompany um, the prohibited list, and these are technical documents for sport specific analysis, which is where I said you have to list your sport and your discipline, because depending on your discipline, we might test for growth hormones or something else um, in that sample as opposed to in another sport. So under the code, a lab might present findings, and this is where there's a question about testosterone. And so this kind of uh, speaks to that. The lab may only report test results involving endogenous substances as atypical findings because there are limits and thresholds now that WADA develops for the list of other substances which may be reported as atypical findings. And an atypical finding versus an adverse finding it might be because those are naturally produced substances from the body, but they're just at a higher level than the anticipated threshold. And so an anti-doping organization, when they are faced with an atypical finding, might trigger an investigation to ensure that there was no um, rule violation involved. Then threshold and certain non-threshold limits, there are decision limits and reporting limits. So there are different consequences if you're in competition or on co out of competition. And the easiest case I could think of here is probably the subuterol that you find in Ventolin inhalers. There are thresholds um, for those substances. So you might find that substance in an athlete's 
urine for that athlete might be an asthmatic taking that substance. But if it's below the threshold for that is now 1800, um, then it would not be reported as an adverse analytical finding. Once the substance is below a particular limit, reporting limit, it won't be reported as an adverse analytical finding. And of course, I'm giving you the administrative viewpoint as it comes to these things, because we have our medical committee uh, who are responsible for ensuring we know down to the last point, milligram, nanogram, et cetera, of how we do the reporting for these. Um, almost there. When it comes to results management, I just wanted to add that there's flexibility in how athletes might be sanctioned for antidoping rule violations. So substances of abuse, like cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, marijuana, there might, they're now three months or lower if the use is out of competition and not geared towards performance enhancement. And then there's, there's further um, parameters. If you can prove that it was not an intentional antidoping rule violation, for evading or refusing sample collection in exceptional circumstances, the rule of thumb is now two to four years, but for protected or recreational athletes, it might be two years to reprimand. So that's minors, um, persons with disability who may not have the legal capacity to say what I'm doing is right or wrong. So we cover all athletes, not just elite, but recreational as well, special, um, special Olympians or special athletes, et cetera. And then, um, if an athlete can prove that there was no significant fault and they're protected person for the presence, use, or possession of an antidoping of a prohibited substance, it is reprimand to two years, but you get sanctioned anyway. That's the, the most important thing is that there is a sanction for antidoping rule violations, but the ways in which those sanctions are meted out differ depending on the category of athlete that we're dealing with. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, I, okay. So in terms of, you know, earlier we talked about the decision by a signatory or appellate body, it's binding on every signatory in sport. So provisional suspension, ineligibility, accepting an ADRV, anti-doping rule violation, disqualification or suspension of or lifting competitions is now binding on all signatories. So you can't go in another jurisdiction and say, well, I'll just go compete here. Everybody has agreed that once we go by these international standards and guidelines, the process is more than likely to be fair. And so in any jurisdiction, you would have found the same reason decision. Now, this is another, um, another, Oh my goodness, the word evades me right now. I want to put, put in the chat another link for Heidi's Father's True. This is a 15 to 20 minute video on um, the Soviet Union state sponsored doping program. One athlete from there. That athlete was Heidi Krieger. When you look on the screen, you see a guy who's Andreas Krieger, is one of the most modern examples we have of the extent to which doping control, not doping control, but doping might be dangerous. Heidi was a 16-year-old girl, but because of using these prohibited substances, over time, she had to have um, a sex reassignment, surgery, etc. I mean, there are other psychological issues at play, but all augmented by the state-sponsored doping program. So I'll put the link in, and you guys can take a look at it and have discussions among yourselves. So in closing, what I want to say is clean sport matters. We always talk about anti-doping in sport and it sounds so negative and it is when athletes take drugs to enhance their performance. But what we are trying to do is rewrite the narrative and we wanna tell everybody that clean sport matters and that our work in anti-doping, though it's in obscurity, we love what we do because we support the creation of a level playing field so that when the starting whistle is blown, we know for some measure of certainty that competition is fair at all levels. And if you want more information about anti-doping, about anything we spoke about, please register at adele.wada-ama.org. Useful resources, 
please share it with your communities, with your athletes, whether they're junior or senior. Log on to Adele. It has a lot of information. We are pushing education under this new code because no athlete should have to see for the first time um, anti-doping or clean sport at a testing program or a testing level. We want to ensure we do education first. So for more information, Facebook, check us on Twitter, uh, karenrado.com at our website, wada-ama.org and ita.sport, which is the international testing agency. So now we're at hopefully the fun part where you get to not hear me talking so much and maybe add a few questions, comments of your own. Um, there was a question about <laughs> high testosterone levels. So, okay. I am not going to speak to what we're seeing from the Olympics, but um, as I said, there are some, some substances or some markers that are naturally produced by the human body. And once it goes over a partic particular threshold, it is reported as an atypical finding. Once it's reported as atypical, then the antidoping organization has a responsibility to do an investigation to see if the athlete took a foreign substance or prohibited substance or actually injected or took testosterone um, intravenously or however, or if that was naturally occurring testosterone levels in their system that was higher. And then depending on what they find, they will then treat with it in that regard. And so that is it for me. I don't know if anybody else has a question. Yes, go ahead, Marie. Yes, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative, I must say. And I like the way that you stress the fact that really and truly with anti-doping, when you say about promoting clean sport, it's not really just about hounding people. It's about promoting a fair, equitable sport where we're all on the same playing field because people have to realize that these athletes, they train all their life, most of their lives for this. This is serious. This is their livelihood. This is their life. And somebody being unfair really puts a huge damp on what they work their whole life for so that's why it's so important yes. um a quick question i would have for you would be since somebody mentioned about testosterone what are your views in regards to people um stating that they would like trans athletes to be able to compete in certain sports because i am of the view i think of it very biologically and you know that having a certain amount of testosterone or whatever it is, you are at an advantage. It's just a biological advantage. And I think it would be very unfair for these women athletes, particularly to be training their whole lives to see somebody who has been born with so much more testosterone, just speed upon them. <laughs> so what do you think about this? I, well, I would even ask you before I answer, what do you think about women who have higher testosterone levels, right? And, you know, I am not speaking on behalf of the Rado here. I'm not speaking on behalf of the IUC. I can answer that question as Sasha Sutherland. And um, I know some females would say it's unfair to have other females with high testosterone levels participate. My view is if you're biologically female, you're biologically female, you just have an unfair advantage that you're producing naturally more testosterone. So when Simone Biles, for example, can do these 50 million flips in the air, personally, there's a disagreement with saying, well, come on, Simone, dumb down your skill because it's unfair to everybody else. We, we don't ask Michael Jordan or Michael Phelps to swim so well because they were ahead of the curve. So for women who have, who've produced natural testosterone at a higher levels, you know, I think there has to be some, some um, degree of accommodation for them without telling them, you know, to do something that is not natural so that they can participate in sport because they're just the best, because it's going to prevent everybody else from doing it. That's one thing. Transgender athletes. <laughs> Again, I'm not representing the Caribbean Rado. Here, I would say that I, 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 
I am, or I identify as Christian. And so my viewpoint is informed by my belief that God does not create anything or he does not make a mistake with his creations. Whether that's creation, whether that creation is a high performing female athlete with, with testosterone, whether that creation is an intersex athlete that we cannot with our logical scientific minds explain, or whether that athlete is an athlete with superb ability to do gymnastics, basketball, or swimming. So having said what my belief is, then I think you know my answer <laughs> to that question, which might not seem like the sociological or the administrative answer. I don't, I don't ascribe to the thought of someone saying, um, you know, I'm in the wrong body. Um, I think that we see representations of what God de determines as a breakaway from a relationship with him. And it, we get representations of that in different ways. So whether that's athlete saying, I feel like I'm a, a male in a female body, whether that is somebody who is promiscuous, whether that is somebody who dislikes white or black people, whether that is um, somebody who just curses like a fisherman, you know, they're all representations of these broken relationships. And it, it is a difficult line to thread when you have a particular belief system and you are called on to love everybody. So I make no judgments as I make this very public statement about what I believe. Um, and so my viewpoint is that I pray <laughs> that God will have his way. I pray that we would exercise compassion for people who feel like they are one gender living in another gender. I, I always pray that we try to understand their position, but that we speak our own truth in love because I am very much aware that people do not have the same religious beliefs that I do. And so I think the responsibility on me is to say my opinion does not matter because I come from a very biased, Christian background. As an administrator, um, the IOC makes their recommendations about rules on diversity and inclusion. And I think sometimes we conflate sex and gender on the black female body. And I think that is a very unfortunate thing. Um, I think that when we make rules, we need to think 10 steps down the road about how those rules will impact. And I think that we need to always be mindful that there are repercussions to everything that we do. So without saying yes, no, or otherwise, I hope that answered your question, Marie. Um, the IOC makes rules and regulations, but I think it is often an unfair advantage to have a male participate, a biological male who may have had gender reassignment surgery and is now identifying as a female participate in sports with biological females. And I think there's also a contradiction when you talk about naturally testosterone producing women, reducing those levels of testosterone by telling someone else because they identify as they can participate. I think there is a double standard in there that needs to be interrogated. So. I don't know if that answers. It may not be the answer you want to hear, but but I understand what you mean in terms of the double standards. What you're saying with women, it seems okay. You're saying, oh no, 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 no. This is not acceptable, even though this this is naturally how it's black supposed. females, black females, yeah, especially yeah. with black um, female athletes. Whereas other persons seem to decide, and then then they decide that's fair for them. Yes. Now. In terms of naturally occurring testosterone, I agree. That's something natural. Just like um, the same way, I believe they were saying Usain Bolt with his fast twitch or whatever, yeah. or um, or Mike, um, or the swimmer, they were saying something. Or even Mike as a swimmer, you may have you may have height that would that's just natural. You may reach there a little faster because you're taller. So mm -hmm. I could understand things, but I do feel as you were saying, they should look into more 
what like what's going to happen down the line when you look at the steps you're taking yeah, that's, yeah i think sport is becoming very politicized and sometimes it's hard in positions like mine where more often than not we try to shut up when it comes to to controversial issues but as a lecturer at the university as a stakeholder in sport you know you you try to advocate or to at least present your situation saying you don't have to agree with me I'm not aiming to represent any organization, but this is how I feel personally. Um, yeah. yeah, but I like the way you gave you gave me your personal interview and you gave your view in terms of professional. So thank you very much. No problem. Um, Shanil, I think that's you with your hands up. Yes, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So the first question, uh, about the situation with the, I don't want to mention names there, but the American situation and with the <laughs> athletes being banned from, well, taking part in the Olympics. Right. I'd just like to share more light on that because I've noticed that on social media, most people make it a race issue rather than an anti-doping issue. Yes, I realize and we all know that Black women in particular always get the worst end of the stick when it comes to anti-doping issues but just to share more light on that anti-doping issue why Shanil? why okay <laughs> so i came prepared though i forget somebody would ask um so you know it really isn't in this case i honestly do not believe it is a race issue there are some things but when, when we do cases, you have to remove yourself, right? And you have to bring the professional viewpoints. Oftentimes, professional viewpoints are shrouded in racism and sexism, et cetera, which is why I made the point that sport and issues with sport often conflates on the Black female body because there are things that Black men might be able to get away with that, that Black women oftentimes do not get away with. And that is my sociological, psychological background. We're not going to go there. Athlete in question. Richardson, 21, won the women's 100 meter race at the track and field trials, but her sample returned an adverse analytical finding for marijuana, which automatically invalidated her result. She accepted the suspension, the period of ineligibility for one month, which started on June 28th, of course, with the caveat that she'd undergo um, rehabilitation. So if you looked at this slide where you talked about sanctions for substances of abuse, it is three months automatically. But if the athlete agrees to undergo rehabilitation, it could be further reduced to one month. In terms of harmonization, harmonizing rules, we recognize that rehabilitation is a very specific thing. And so there's no worldwide guideline into how rehabil rehabilitation occurs. Now, the positive test for that athlete erased her performance at the Olympic trial. So it dictates that the top three finishers in a given event um, qualify for the Olympics, provided their trials reach the Olympic standards. If your results are disqualified, you cannot participate. I think the larger issue is that people do not understand anti-doping rules, which is why there's such a big push for education, which is why I requested that we go first because we show people that Yes, sport nutrition is important. Um, physiotherapy is important. Understanding the dynamics of the game, um, understanding media relations is important. But what we do in the background is even more important because when something like this happens and all of a sudden everybody's giving their opinion, but they haven't read the good book, not the Bible, but the code, right? So the 2021 code, we have to read this day in, day out. We have to read the international standards so that we give proper advice. So marijuana is banned in competition, right? And when you talk about in competition, you're talking about the period 11.59 on the day before the competition in which the athlete is participating through to the end of the competition and the sample collection process. So if the competition ends at four, but you are still in the sample collection station at 4.30 because you haven't passed the urine, you can't say that's an out of competition sample. It's still in competition because your, your procedure is not yet finished. Now, the substance that was in that marijuana sample, THC, um, 
the athletes are allowed to have up to 150 nanograms per milliliter of THC, which is the psychoactive agent in marijuana without causing a positive test. Remember, before we talked about thresholds. So obviously, the nanograms per milliliter in that athlete sample was above the threshold. Now, you saw they reported marijuana is a prohibited substance because it can enhance performance. It poses a health risk to athletes and it violates the spirit of sport. Now, that is the way that a substance it makes it on the prohibited list. There's a three prong criteria. It contravenes the sport ethic, it poses a potential health risk, or it can enhance performance. So if you meet two of those three criteria, ta da, you make it to the prohibited list. Something else that people, I guess, did not know but decided we want to weigh in on. Um, so the rules are clear and USADA said it was heartbreaking on many levels, but they lauded her acceptance and of the responsibility and her apology. So, you know, just to overcome regrettable decisions. And I think even President Biden had said rules are rules, but they, they were proud that she acknowledged and apologized for it. So why is marijuana on the prohibited list? I think is the broader question. It is a substance of abuse. Um, and again, this is one of the major changes that was put into the code to avoid inadvertent doping. So before, if you had marijuana in your system, you can get a two year suspension. But again, because the athlete is at the center of what we do, what we recognize is somebody might smoke weed outside a competition, but they may smoke weed every day, all day, just to calm the nerves, et cetera. So you don't wanna give somebody a two year ban for smoking a substance that's not um, prohibited out of competition, but then because you have such high levels, it turns up in competition. The threshold is, is exceeded in competition because you really didn't smoke it to gain an advantage, but you have regulations. So marijuana falls under this whole substance abuse category, um, and it's also one of the, the ones where it's a substance not prohibited out of competition, but it might turn up in competition. The other substances are cocaine, which is a stimulant, heroin or diamorphine, which is a narcotic, MDMA, which is methylene dio. Um, methamphetamine, which is ecstasy, is another stimulant, and then THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the psychoactive agent in cannabis products, right? So it's there, it's in the rules. Now, um, what do I want to say? The code provides a conciliation or compromise for athletes and anti-doping organizations to say, fast acceptance, three months further reduced if you undergo rehabilitation. Why? The money that we spent chasing a case that inadvertent doping can be spent trying to catch deliberate cheaters. And so that's the major difference with how we treat with substances of abuse versus other prohibited substances on the list, the sanctioning um, of those substances. Now, athletes who want to use medicinal marijuana, right? You have to obtain a TUE. So nobody's saying you shouldn't use it. But if you know you're using it for medicinal reasons, you do the same thing that the other athletes have to do. You go to your doctor, you say, I'm using medicinal marijuana for X, Y, or Z, and they make an application to that review committee. Now, you have to meet the criteria for the international standards. And so the only, or not only, but the most well-studied use of medicinal marijuana is for the management of chronic pain conditions, right? Neuropathic pain not for common nerves, et cetera. So, you know, the short answer is there, there are rules. There is an application of the rule that again centers the athlete. The athlete quickly acknowledged. And so the rest of the American sporting community, I think jumped perhaps on a case for something that was not understood because they were describing it in terms of legal ramifications and sport as a social world has its own rules and own regulations and the only way to combat misunderstandings like that again is to do things like these have webinars share the information so that people know that substances of abuse are not new to sport they are long-standing issue for athletes the code does not pretend like they're hard and fast when it comes to substances of abuse the code is a very living document and with every iteration we try to understand whether a trend or behaviors in sport mean that the code should be adjusted to accommodate 
And so it has been to the extent where the sanctioning has been drastically reduced. But could you imagine if we had every athlete taking ecstasy and cocaine and heroin, but at the same time talking about the values of Olympism, respect, excellence, fair play, from a sociological perspective. Again, this is a, a sidebar. So we have to recognize that there's sometimes double standards in sport, but anti-doping organizations are doing what they can to uphold the, the, the code, while at the same time understanding that, you know, it may not fit all three criteria, but it at least does harm on two levels. And so we have to implement the rules and recommendations. So I hope that answers <laughs> the question comprehensively. Yes, it did. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? No, but if we don't, I want to say it has been a pleasure being here. Roxanne Snyder, hello. I'm giving you a big shout out. Um, she's going to do oh, big hair, things. In Pardon me? I didn't hear her. She's going to do big things in sport, y'all. Um, Chanel is already doing fantastic things with supporting girls in sport. I want to just commend the work that y'all are doing in St. Lucia with this program. I want to say thanks to FIBA Americas for supporting you guys. Um, supporting girls in sport is amazing. I'm following y'all on, on the social media platform and it's just a joy to see women in sport being celebrated and we're not trying to take away from the guys in any way, but you know, there's a complementary relationship that we can you know, just use to support each other and, and to give women a push to take up leadership positions and to participate in sport, even if it's just for recreation. And Shanil, I just want to commend you for what you guys are doing. St. Lucia Basketball, thank you for supporting this initiative. And I wish you all success with the rest of the development workshops. And I see CBC is here. Um, that is Valica. Um, if it is, thank you for joining and supporting. And I hope more people watch the recording and participate. Yes. That's Freddie Brown, actually. <laughs> the two, pardon? Freddie Brown. Oh, hi, Freddie. Uh, How yes, are you? Well, nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, wonderful presentation, actually. Oh, thank you. I got you. it from Bellica, sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's good to hear a male voice, too. <laughs> it's, it's we welcome we welcome real support you know what we do is not possible without partnerships with our brothers or males in sports so it's not about women here and men there but it's a collaborative effort so that there's equity in representation so thank you for joining and for unmuting your mic and and saying hi yes i share a concept yeah okay so over to you Shanil. Yes, thank you everyone for coming, for participating. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, thank you. Sasha taught us at UE undergrad. It was a, an experience, but thank you for agreeing to facilitate this workshop. We greatly appreciate it. I think that anti doping and raising the awareness and providing more education on that topic is important as we see a lot of people do not know anything or have very little information on it so i hope that they will be viewing this recording and also hopefully the slides so you will send us the slides so we can share with those who aren't here but thank you again everyone and we have our second workshop tomorrow at 12 p.m so with roxanne snyder she will be presenting on mental skills in sports so Yay. i hope to see everyone there